Dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, I am greatly honoured to be invited to present uh, this topic on the uh, journey along the maritime silk route, the crafting of um, Malay Zapin uh, from Hadramaut to the Malay Peninsula, which is part of my ongoing research and more interestingly, my interest in looking at the effects of the maritime silk route in the making and crafting of the Zapin in the Malay world. This presentation is divided into several parts and I, will, I shall walk along with you as uh, we go through this presentation. The journey along the maritime silk route, um, uh, if you look at the crafting of it, of the, the Malay Zapin, from Hadramaut to the Malay Peninsula, uh, deals with several issues. One is the silk road itself, uh, more than 15,000 kilo, 15, kilometers of network of uh, sea networks of silk routes linking the east and west. The ports as providers for um, the meeting of uh, people and also melting pots of creative activities and cultural exchanges, extolling the virtues of intercultural uh, exchanges into new works of art, music and dance. It is also a a place where intercultural, interreligious exchanges are created, producing syncretic hybrid performances uh, to which um, the indigenous communities invent their hybrid performances from uh, the autochthonous or what is native to them, what is original to them, and influence from outside, which is accessed as, as autochthonous, originating in a place other than where it is found. Uh, the Malay Zapin, in this case, is a very syncretic uh, hybrid performance tradition amongst many. It is one of the most syncretic, invented by the indigenous communities in the Malay Peninsula through the encounters with the Hadrami Arabs. We shall deal with that, uh, the Hadrami Arabs in Hadramaut, a region in South Arabia, mostly in present-day Eastern Yemen. This tradition embodies Arabic, Malay, Islamic nuances that are often secular, but covertly religious or sacred. These processes continue today, recollecting cultural norms, memories and practices based on the recognition of differences and similarities between cultures towards the development of hybrid cultures and performative experience. The following slide uh, is a depiction of the maritime and continental silk routes. The red lines uh, represent the continental silk routes. The blue line represents the maritime silk routes. Uh, we are talking about the maritime silk routes, the blue line, from all the way from um, the Mediterranean crossing over to Egypt, the Red Sea, and towards the South China Sea. The following uh, section in this presentation is on the encounters and exchanges. Uh, which is also processes and uh, interventions that happen in the invention of uh, a new tradition and the making of hybrid tradition in, uh, in the Malay archipelago. And this is where I would like to also introduce certain terms of references, such as the term allochthonous, uh, autochthonous, and of course, syncretism. The next uh, slide uh, explains the encounters and exchanges by looking at inventions and hybrids. The East-West connection, of course, in the history of uh, civilization from the onset of the Maritime Silk Road has brought in Indic Buddhist Islamic influences from across the West and East with indigenous interpretation overlaid. Then we also have created tradition, which is again here in the context of originality, uh, forms that are not found elsewhere, but inspired by those traditions, the Taira Makian, the Javanese Wayang Wong, the Malaysian Javanese Balinese Wayang Kulit. And there's also a very specific tradition that was created uh, from the idea of the Buddhist avatar. In the case of the Burmese uh, Yamajatao, uh, which becomes the national epic of the Burmese, uh, another version of Ramayana. But I think here is where I would, I would like to stress my, my talk about Islam, Islamic and Sufi Islam and Sufism, introducing the notion of performative Sufism in the tariqah practices that came about through the connectivity of autochthonous, allochthonous and syncretic tradition. Islamic encounters, uh, when, when we look about 
Islamic accounters, uh, processes of Islamic accounters, um, will have to look into the performative accounters in the maritime silk route. The word performative uh, means the capacity of expressing actions to perform a type of performance or becoming, uh, becoming a being of form. These encounters happen in a silk route impacted by high culture, religiosity and popular culture, extolling the virtues of intercultural happenstances. It embraces the cultural objects of aesthetic value, which is uh, a society collectively esteemed as exemplary art. It may also include intellectual works considered to be of supreme philosophical, historical or literary value as well as educatively uh, training and cultivating aesthetics and intellectual pursuits. All these are littered along the maritime silk route, collected, borrowed by the travellers and exchanged uh, among the communities along the silk route by the upper class, the aristocrat, the intelligentsia and the commoners to become a society's common repository of broad range knowledge and tradition. For example, uh, in the folk culture itself that transcend the social class system of society. The processes and product of uh, performative encounters, of course, came about through the interplay of autochthonous, autochthonous and eventually the systemic recreation or invention of syncretic works. Autochthonous tradition, as I say, is native. It is native to where it is found. It is practiced by indigenous, it has its originality, it is very different, it's very unique. Allochtonous are traditions that originated in, in other places, brought to another place. And the convergence of the allochtonous uh, into the native autochtonous mind view uh, or worldview brought about tradition that are very unique because of this uh, meeting of two uh, elements. You see the Ramakian, as I said, the Yamajatau in Burma, the Wayang Wong and the Wayang Kulit. The allochtonous autochtonous tradition itself as a product produces hybrids and syncretic tradition. And in this particular case, I would like to look and present the idea of the allochtonous autochtonous uh, repository in the Arab Malay Zafin that eventually became what we call Zafin. Uh, as, as, as comparatively to what we know of the Portuguese Kristang Branho and Mata Katiga in Malacca, uh, which is uh, uh, very interestingly unique now, simply because it has no longer been 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 spoken of and practiced in in in, in Portugal. So the Portuguese are coming to uh, to relook at the Kristang tradition, and of course one of another good example of the autochthonous autochthonous tradition, the hybrid tradition, is of the Koronchong, which is uh, also another co-joint uh, interplay of culture exchanges from the Malay and Portuguese performative arts. Therefore, the question of the meeting of these ideas, either eloquence or talkness, uh, resulted in the eclectic collections of intercultural performative hybrids. And this collection and these processes continues as, as we are talking. In the context of the Islamic encounters, we look at the Sikh route and insular South Asia as being very specific here. Now, when we look about Islamic encounters in, in, in the Malay archipelago, we are not necessarily talking about Islamic conversion, but we are talking about maritime trade opportunities. We are talking about Muslim trading communities uh, that became commercial focal points along the northeastern coast of Sumatra and on the Malay Peninsula, the northern coast of Java, Borneo and Celebes. Through the Muslim trading communities and the focal points uh, came about the establishment of Islamic states and the role of Islamized sultanates in the region. It was uh, a slow conversion, really. It wasn't forceful, but it embodies the, the mixture of the local and the foreign in the context of Islamization in this part of the world. And in sense, here again, it affirms the allochtonous, autochthonous uh, values of syncretity and hybridity. For example, if you look into zikir as a practice, Islamic practice of remembrance or recitation of the divine names, it then merges with indigenous practices. So zikir is not done as it was in the Middle East, but is done in the context of the local culture. This then brought us, uh, brought about the development or the embracement of uh, encounters with Sufism 
and eventually performative Sufism. And in this case, I would like to look into the Zapin as a good example. The encounters with performative Sufism, again, performative Sufism here means um, the expressive actions of Sufis, yes, a, to perform a type of Sufistic, Sufistic performance practice. And it is a performative behavior because the action takes specifically to focus upon the audience in mind, to elicit a response or reaction. And it is also a response or reaction to the mystical Islamic practice through which one seeks out the true meaning of divine love and knowledge via the personal connection with God. It involves sensorial perception of Sufism that deals with the notion of self, of psyche, in the dance and music of insular Southeast Asia, embodied in three central ideas, nafs, self, ego, soul, psyche, hub, the heart, and roh, spirit. These three central ideas have been expounded by sophistic commentaries to experience divine revelation. Performers who are followers of a Sufi order called Tarika perform the rituals of the hub, the hub as the eye of the heart, that nourishes the soul, the nafs, that which directed to the spirit, the raw, towards divine connection, an ephemeral permeation of Islamic aesthetics and expressions that negotiate temporality, which is diachronical and synchronical, linear in form, time and space. Musicians and dancers embody the harp through performative mute of zikir, meaning zikir is silent, is muted within specific tarika, and tarika itself as sensorial pathways toward inward contemplation of God and of existence. We have looked into the, uh, the encounters as a process, and I would also like to introduce uh, the context of the mediators, the interlocutors, uh, the agents, uh, the influence they have brought about, how the, um, the meeting of the mediators and agents uh, of change uh, brought about the uh, hybrid form and um, appreciation of syncretic values in this part of the world. Mediators of performative Sufism in Southeast Asia, if you look at the, the way it is now, uh, one cannot um, really um, uh, dismiss the, the role of the Hadramis from Hadramaut. Hadramaut uh, is a region in South Arabia, mostly in present-day Eastern Yemen. These are traders and they mediate commerce and religiosity at the same time. They are traders and, and they focus on commerce, but they are very religious. And therefore, the enclave of the Hadramis in port cities in, in, in insular Southeast Asia, along the Straits of Malacca, the Java Sea, Sulu Sea, Straits of Makassar and the Malukas, become very unique uh, enclaves, uh, which is named again, uh, uh, remembrance and names again with the re remembering the names of places that they came from. Um, because these are trans, uh, transient and patriarchal communities, um, the need of having a household or permanent domicile become quite quite common and that has brought in intermarriages and the role of intermarriages therefore expedite the processes of change and exchanges. Therefore, again here within the context of intermarriages, the Hadrami literati are also scribes or, or uh, advisors as cultural, political, religious mediators or interlocutors in the Malay royal courts and aristocratic communities. The, they are known to be very, very knowledgeable and they became interlocutors who are discreetly and silently dominated the, the process of Islamization in insular Southeast Asia. Therefore, the Hadramis became important agents in the transmission, development, and vernacularization of Islamic disciplines and performative Sufism. And then you can see here on the map here uh, where Hadramaut is, and right there is Yemen, the Republic of Yemen. But the second slide shows us where uh, the area of Hadramaut is. And the area of Hadramaut is basically what you have seen here. Uh, the word written Hadramaut is really uh, in the the corner of south southeastern corner, but not really too too far away, uh, too near the Oman state, or too far away from central Yemen in the eastern Yemen. 
these places are recognized um, with certain port cities. Uh, you can see the word there, the port cities of Mokala and, and others. And that's what, these are the port, very important uh, points of departure and points of return for the Hadramis. The uh, notion of the Hadramis and their, and their cities are quite remarkable. They are very important cities that uh, are considered to be quite sacred and very holy. Uh, Shibam, for example, this is the city of Shibam. The architecture of the houses, um, you know, towers of mud and straw. Then the city of Sa'yun, uh, where, you know, the, is also a very important point of reference of the Hadramis and eventually to the um, maritime um, uh, indigenous population of Southeast Asia. And of course, the, the, the grave of Tarim, they call it, or this is where is a, a place in Hadramaut where sacred graves and graves of, of uh, important personnel um, uh, are being visited often. Now, all this notion of the place name and the uh, context of practices are brought by the Hadrami descendants of Ba'alawi or Bani Alawi. These are the Sayyids. People who are blood descendants of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, through Alawi bin Ubaid Abdullah bin Ahmad al Muhajir. There's another group also of the Hadrami, the Alawin. They are also Said, but they uh, are used to describe descendants of Ali bin Abi Talib from the from the from Hussein bin Ali, and descendants of Hassan bin Ali are called Sharifs. So in this context also, the practices of having um, the memory of place and time and history uh, becomes very important in the way the association of the allochthonous is in the process of the development of the autochthonous. Therefore, when we look at the encounters exchanges and exchanges in Southeast Asia, it is very important to remember that uh, the outsourcing of place name and heritage and practices becomes very, very crucial in the transformation of these into indigenous hybrid forms. And here's the map that we can see from, the, from here where you, you find almost all of the coastal um, cities and um, uh, communities along the Straits of Malacca all the way down to the Java Sea and it goes all the way to the east to the Banda Sea. North of it is the Makassar Strait and you one will see that the influence of the Hadramis from Aceh all the way to Timur, uh, sorry, all the way to Nusa Tenggara in eastern Indonesia up to northeast of the part called Halmahera and, and Makassar. Now, what is then resemblance of the, the Zapin of the Hadrami? This is a notion of how the Zapin of Hadrami is performed. It is performed within the set and space of, um, of, of male, all male um, uh, uh, practitioners of this Zapin. And we want to look at the example next one for you to have a look at how it is. Let's enjoy it a bit. <laughs>
was the Zafin from Hadramaut. Uh, as you noticed, uh, the performers are all men uh, dancing in pairs and they come in and out to replace the dancers while the music continues or the sung text or the kasida continues. Uh, there's again a huge chorus uh, that also are practitioners and performers in the way uh, the interlocking uh, clapping are done and that gives the ambiance of a very different set of tradition. This is the um, allochthonous tradition that came from the Hadrami. And this practice, which is in that context, what you saw just a moment ago, is a, in a sacred space, uh, is also transposed into a secular space uh, that is performed by contemporary, uh, by contemporary Hadramis or descent, descendants of the Hadramis. And this is a case in Singapore. Let's see this being performed in a wedding uh, situation uh, here in Singapore. differences between the performance in a sacred space and performance in a public space. Uh, but uh, yes, you recognize uh, this is really exclusively performed by the Hadramis and descendants of the Hadramis. Uh, hence, the allochthonous uh, tradition remains allochthonous. But however, uh, they have influenced, as I said, in the past to create what we have inherited in the present, uh, the Malay Zabin, uh, which I believe is a collective effort by the indigenous communities uh, in, in, in Insular South Asia to affirm their relationship to the Arabic Islamic tradition, affirm their relationship to the space that is considered holy. And therefore, in this presentation, I will talk about crafting the Malay Zapin by looking into uh, three uh, sets or three uh, views, one of which is the first one would be a macro view and following that would be the meso view and finally looking at the micro view of uh, how Zapin is crafted. And the beginning of Zapin, as I said, is, is always uh, inspired by the Hadramis and they were because of the Silk Route and because of the trading centers and because of the cultural exchanges. And, and from micro view, it signifies, it is, signifies Arabic, Islamic, Malay representation. So the, Zapin, the Malay Zapin has Arabic nuances, Islamic representation, and its Malay form. At the meso level, a meso view, it is, it is a Malay tradition. It is not Arabic, as we saw just a moment ago. It has become uh, an autochthonous created to be a toughness but of a hybrid uh, form. And at the micro view, it is again, likewise, in the beginning of the talk of performative Sufism, Zapin is Zikir. And with that, I will conclude at the end of my talk, uh, summing up all these three levels. Now, let's look at the background of Zapin in Johor. As I said again, it is uh, adapted from the Hadramis, from Hadramaut, from the Zafin, that's the word they use. It is an uh, adaptation that is syncretized from the dance and singing genres. So in Johor today, you still have the Malay Zapin, the Arab Zapin. You know, it remains entities of their own. The hybridized one is the one that we are looking at, the Malay Zapin, which has, is more refined uh, to fit into the aesthetics of the Malay psyche. And uh, they considered 
playing the playing or performing as playing uh, this is very very important in the context of the Malay Zappin uh, the word mind or play becomes central in uh, the execution of the Zappin the notion of mind or play in the Malay language denotes activity done for amusement for recreation or things done for pleasure it also means taking part in a game or to compete against someone in a game at a slightly more converged meaning. It could also mean performing musical instruments and performing structured movement system, dance, or any form of dance likened to playing a game or of um, a game of dance. So this is very, very, very different from the way it is uh, practiced in by the era uh, Hadramis. However, I'm not saying that that is also the part of the the micro level, the intrinsic part of the Zikir. So it is here comparatively, I'd like to put this up for you uh, to look at. As I said, the Malay Zafin was created from the Arab Zafin as a hybrid um, to have its own expression, but to sustain that uh, uh, pseudo-Arabic expression in the Malay context. Uh, it is also known by various names in, uh, in, in, in the Malay archipelago as Chipin, Japin, Zapin, Zafin, Dana, whatever not. Malaysia, Indonesia, Southern Thailand, Brunei and Singapore that celebrates events associated with wedding, circumcision and social events of religious significance such as Maudul Rasul. Whereas the Zafin of the Hadram remains intact. It is performed by them, for them, with the instruments as such as the old, uh, the pear-shaped lute and the uh, drums, the single uh, the hand drums on the marwas and also the singing of the qasida and sometimes the takmis and this is performed by the ba'alawi of the hadramis. In the case of the hadrami zapin, their dance and music are commonly associated with the kabila or tribe of the bani of bani ba'alawi. And therefore, in the next level, at the, 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 the level of looking at the comparison of the Malay Zapin and the Hadrami Zapin, syncreticity and hybridity remains a, a very important markers, or signifiers of the uh, Malay Zapin. Whereas in the Arabic Zapin, it represents the tradition of music and dance of the people from Wadi Hadramaut, um, who speaks Wadi Hadramic Arab. Uh, it took root in Malay Zapin, it took root in the Malay Peninsula, Singapore, and throughout the islands of Indonesia from the 15th century onwards in the form of peculiar tradition, as I said, uh, which is enhanced by the fact there was a large-scale migration early 19th century that enhances the identity of the Hadrami Zapin, where, while the Malay Zapin the, evolves on its own track. Now, um, the indigenous um, Malay Zapin uh, are to be found along the shores of East Sumatra, West Peninsula, Malaysia, Singapore, Java, Kalimantan, South and Southeast Sulawesi, Ternate, Halmahera, and the island Nusa Tenggara. Impacted by the presence of Hadrami migrants who became important traders in the coming from the cities uh, of uh, Shibba, Musa, Yun, and Tari, which I've showed just now. And they are uh, a very important people in the context of Malay psyche because they are the descendants of the Prophet. And then the Hadramis even became rulers in the Sultan of Sia in Palembang, in Sumatra, Pontiana, in West Kalimantan, and they married into the royal families. Whereas the Zapin, which is Zapin of the Arab, the Arab Zapin, remains part of their tribal society of the old Saidid aristocracy uh, uh, as a mark of the, being descendants of the Holy Prophet. Uh, the tradition of takmins and qasida and metric composition or sung poem are brought and are, are left intact as it is. It's never changed. It's performed as it is and is uh, continued as a tradition. And therefore, apart from them being highly revered as al Sada or Sayyid or Said, uh, they are also uh, of uh, represent the two big um, uh, groupings or the bani that is the Ba'alawiyah in the Shadin. So this again marks how the Zafin of the Arab remains at it is while the Malay Zafin continues to evolve. Now the examples that I've given you um, uh, which showed the clear demarcation of these Hadrami Zafin and the Malay Zafin uh, not, does not necessarily means that 
uh, uh, there is not a strong influence in some of the Malay Zapin in the Malay archipelago. I would like you to see an example from the Zapin of the um, Tidong community. The Tidong community, this is in southeast Sabah. The Tidongs came from the Sultanates of Bulungan and um, they are diasporic in Sabah and they maintain this tradition which is extremely powerful representation of the Arab Zafin in the Malay Zafin of Tidong. Let's watch. That was uh, uh, an excerpt of um, Zapin Tido. Um, that would, I would like to leave that as it is, so that we can remember this. Uh, that even in the invented tradition of the Zapin in the Tido case, uh, the strong influence of the Hadrami Zapin is still intact. But at the meso level, at the meso view of Zapin, uh, this is very important for us to look at what it means to the Malays, what Zapin means to the Malays. And in so doing, we have to look into what is the structure of the Malay Zapin as opposed to the structure or the form that we just have seen a moment ago. The meso view of uh, the Malay Zapin here uh, is conventionally structured into three parts. The first part is called Taksim, an improvised solo by a single owned or gambus player, the lute player, and that he plays alone. The second part is the melodic section, where you find that the verses are connected a bridge by loud rhythmic interlocking maras drumming called kopa. And once the cycles of melodic cycles of kopa uh, in between the cycles are completed, then comes the final section which is called Waina or Wainak or Tahtim. And these sections correspond in very similar way, precisely in fact, with the music and the dance. So if you look at the next slide, you will see what I've done here to show the sections are connected from the beginning, a section called the Taksim, uh, connecting to the first one is the playing of the song Main Lagu, uh, into the melodic section, which has the sun quatrain as punctuate and punctuated with the loud interlocking marwas called kopak, and eventually leading to waina, uh, which is uh, again marked by loud interlocking drumming patterns uh, and the coda. In the dance, it comes with this uh, salutation uh, or the salam salutation uh, during the playing of the taksim. Well, in the main dance section, uh, the dancers mo perform uh, motifs of movement clustered within repeated um, ABC units of the music, uh, inclusive of the uh, motifs within uh, the, the muted sound, if there are muted sound. And the cycle ends with the wind-up section, consisting of variation of skips, runs, low plié, standing and squatting position. The three sections are embodied 
uh, by the virtual application of musical instruments such as the lute or the oud here. It is called the gambus. This is Middle Eastern, but there are in Malay world other form of lute or gambus which are uh, made specifically to suit the kinds of context of the performance. Then they use the hand drums, the marwas, which is a very crucial double-headed cylindrical drum, uh, very crucial to produce the interlocking pattern uh, that marks uh, the bridging of uh, the cycle of sang quatrains. The context of playing here is to play zapin, it's a game. So you can see a visualization of the playing of zapin in this, in this particular slide. So let's move on and see the differences between uh, what we have seen earlier to what we have today. The following video will show you the, an example of an archaic uh, Malay Zapin in Johor in uh, the um, area where it is still very, very important as a reference point. This is from Lenga, not far from Moa, Johor. And this, this one, when you see the archaic Lenga, you'll find the men are performed with men in pairs, crossing spaces, but repeatedly just that. Because it is not, remember, it's just not the movement that is important. It's not just the music is important. It's the intrinsic value uh, of the zikir, of the heart, of the hulk, which I will explain later on. Following that video, we will also look at another version, which is, um, again, uh, coming from the Malay world, from Malay archipelago, which is um, in the uh, Bengkali Straits of Selat Panjang that will show you a more refined tradition because it was brought and performed into the palace. Uh, this is the one, one, the one that we are seeing is performed by the villagers. The second one you will see uh, is a tradition that has been refined uh, under the patronage of the Sultan. Let's see the archaic Lenga Zapin. <laughs>
Um, now allow me uh, to indulge in uh, a small aspect of the micro analysis of the zapping, looking at the music and looking at the tunes and the lyric uh, so that we will be able to understand uh, that not only what we have seen is um, a reenaction re or representation of the secular presentation uh, for entertainment, uh, but it also has a deeper connection uh, to the idea of the sacred. So in this context, we're looking at the uh, what we have seen, the extrinsic element of Zapin, perhaps here we could see some intrinsic qualities of the Zapin by listening to this song. First and foremost, I would like you to just uh, relax and listen to this song and we'll talk about it after this. Muhammad 
So we have heard the song. I'm 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 thankful for to all of you for for um, listening to this song because I really want to show um, the intrinsic um, elements of the song in Zapin. I've transcribed here the verses one and two. I if you look on your uh, your in front of you, you will see the uh, on the left side is. Um, uh, in Malay and the right side is the English translation. The verse one uh, lines begin with Awal Bismillah, Awal Bismillah Mula di Surat, which in English it means the beginning of Basmalah in the name of God. The beginning of Basmalah is now written. This is repeated again, the next line. In the third line it says, Sudah di Surat, Sudah di Surat di Gulung Gulung. So it's once written, once written, fold it up. Folding up means um, in folding the text, like the holy text of the Abrahamic text, uh, and the text that follows are being folded up, written on heights and being folded up. And the chorus go Yahana Yahana, which is it means O oh, compassion, O oh, kindness. It repeats again Sudah di Surat, Sudah di Surat di Golong Golong. Once written, once written, folded up. And Yahana 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 Nana. All compassion, all kindness, all mercifulness. Uh, this is verse number one. In verse number two, it goes, <clears throat> Nabi Muhammad, Nabi Muhammad turun berangkat. <clears throat> Prophet Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad began to depart. Repeated again. And then followed by uh, the third line, Turun Jibra'il, Turun Jibra'il membawa payung. Gabriel descends, Gabriel descends with his parasol. The word parasol is a metaphor to the cloud cover. So in the way when the Holy Prophet walks in the hot um, sun, he was always um, shaded by the cloud. So the cloud is the parasol that Gabriel carries. And then the cross go, Yahana, Yahana, O compassion, O kindness. And the verse again goes to Gabriel descends, Gabriel descends with his parasol, and followed by the chorus, Yahana, 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 Nana, O compassion, O kindness, O mercifulness. And this verse is sung, maybe sung many times, then it ends with a coda. And the coda, you heard the coda, it goes, Allah wainak. What it means is, embrace me, Allah. Wainak is the word for wainak. Embrace me, Allah. And then uh, they ask for you to find, search, cari, cari. It means also for the dance person <clears throat> to, to find the path, the beats, to find the motif without the songs. And for the... Um, for the believers to find where God is, to embrace Him. And eventually, the last of the uh, verse, in the end of the coda, is Salam Alaik, uh, which means, may Allah honor Him and grant Him peace. The previous, um, just recent um, explanation of the sung text, or the Qasida, uh, is an example of a micro-analysis of the intrinsic elements of Zapin. Uh, in the way the text is very thick and heavy, only understood to the those who understand the esoteric. For those who doesn't understand the esoteric, it is just a performance, just an entertainment. So there is this extrinsic element of playing the Zapin or performing the Zapin and the intrinsic element of spirituality or sacred 
element of the spiritual pathway that connects uh, the notion of the nafs, that is the self, the ego, and the heart, the eye of the heart, and that of um, the connection of the totality of the nafs and the heart and the spirit, the roh. Now, uh, the following example uh, will show you uh, an example of how a zapin is performed as a play or mine. And this is a stage performance which was performed by the Joho Heritage Foundation. Uh, but it's important to understand that the similar singing um, uh, technique and uh, musical expose is used and how the dancers interpret uh, the, the sung text to the form of playing the zapin. We shall now see the example from the Joho Heritage Foundation.
we have just seen an example of um, mind zapping or playing and gambling or frolicking uh, with the zapping movements and songs uh, and the music. And we have also uh, visited a bit uh, of the elements of intrinsic uh, zapping in the context of the spiritual space and the sacred space. I would like to continue to uh, perhaps explain a bit more of the extrinsic expression of mind zapping. Here, the context of mind or play, uh, as I've said again and again, is about playing around with a set of movements motif. Therefore, extrinsically zapping is a secular form of entertainment involving the sharing of space that is brought to life by the interaction of community members who are both performers and spectators. The playing or performing zapping is akin to a game of hands and leg movements, um, inextricably connected to music, songs and musical compositions where music and dance intermingle to form a single inseparable entity that involves the sharing of space brought to life by the interaction of community members who are both performers and spectators. In this context, music as structured sound and dance as structured movement both take place simultaneously and in close connection to each other, overlapping and even vanishing in a complex intermingling of music and dance where movement and sound complement each other to form an inseparable entity, enhancing the playing, gambling, frolicking discourses, i.e. in this context, mind zapping. It teases the dancers to negotiate and comprehend the interchangeable nuances of movements and sounds, reflecting the overall comprehension of zapping as being both music and dance. Neither of these exists as a separate entity. Hence, the playing of zapping uh, is both music, dancing, singing, and uh, the presence of spectators, performers. Now, therefore, playing zapping is a play performance that could be participated by all. It is a recreational product rather than a process. To perform Zapin Joho is akin to playing a game, in other words, musicking, mind lagu, dancing, mind zapping as part of playing the zapping game. And in this, it is within this context that the concept of play performance or bermain is to be understood for the purpose of sourcing and identifying the artistic idioms that have shaped and challenged the Zoho, Joho Zapin repertoires. Then I would like, uh, in, in, in this following excerpt, for example, um, which I guess would be the last but not least in the video examples, to again show the concept of mind zapping by men and women. So all this while we have seen all men performing zapping because zapping, uh, as in the Hadrami tradition, are, the reserve, are reserved for men, men, male performers or men only. But um, in, the, in the context of Malay Zapin, women are allowed to perform. And in such, uh, in such cases here, we see an example of how men and women perform together, but in separate groups. So it's very interesting how the gender groupings again are emphasized. And this is the example of students from University of Malaya and Sultan Idris Education University uh, performing a mind Zapin uh, at the International Conference on Dance Education, which was held in 2014. Enjoy this video.
first in epilogue um i would like to raise these few points uh in this presentation that the maritime silk route uh, as a conduit for intercultural interreligious exchanges creating syncretic and hybrid performance traditions uh, in the Malay archipelago and in particular in Johor as example of the Johor Zapping. And it also deals with the issues of uh, the interventions of, of, of autochthonous uh, tradition native to the place where it is found and the uh, autochthonous influences originating in a place other than where it is found. So the Hadrami influence over the making of the native uh, tradition of Zapin. The Malay Zapin, as a syncretic hybrid performative tradition, was invented by the indigenous communities in the Malay Peninsula through the encounters with the Hadrami Arabs from Hadramaud in uh, coming from present-day Eastern Yemen. It embodies Arabic, Malay, Islamic nuances that are extrinsically secular, as you have seen in the Mayan Zapin, and intrinsically spiritual, as you've seen in the analysis of the sung text, connecting the nafs, the self-ego solar psyche, with the khalb, the heart, the eye of the heart, and the raw spirit. These processes continue today. Hence, recollecting cultural norms, memories, and practices based on the recognition of differences and similarities between cultures towards the development of hybrid cultures and performative expression continues as new forms emerge from the old. And I hope uh, in closing, uh, where I feel that um, if you are interested to um, know more, there are several readings, uh, references that I have uh, included in the slide following this. And I hope that uh, you will be able to peruse more information and perhaps then en enjoy the performances of Malay Zapin uh, when you see them live anywhere from now on. And hopefully you will also understand the connectivity between the extrinsic mind Zapin and the intrinsic uh, spiritual self of performance, which is connected to performative Sufism, uh, which I've tried to draw to your attention. So performative Sufism, uh, which was a catalyst for the movement of this tradition to this part of the world, uh, was subjected to a uh, new interpretation, to remain as ex extrinsically secular, or to be um, uh, used or practiced as intrinsically sacred. Of course, I don't have time to talk more about performative uh, sophistic zapping here, but I hope that will this have given you uh, a window to that. And with this, you will see for a moment uh, the readings that will come in here in the slides. Uh, you can see, for example, if you love to know more of the genealogy of uh, the mobility across the ocean, Indian Ocean by the Hadramis, read the graves of Tarim by Eng Seng Ho. And there are some of my works here, uh, as you can see, and all you need to do, um, you know, not being, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, it is simple, simple, as I say, is easiest way is to just Google these uh, titles or name of authors, and you will find them in many libraries, some are online uh, publications. So I hope that uh, you are encouraged to, to look into this publication and perhaps enjoy um, the experience that you will have from now on with Zapin. Thank you very much. Professor Dr. Anis, that was uh, that was such a beautiful presentation. So Zapin is not just a dance to entertain, 
but also we can sing praises for 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 God the Almighty. And uh, now we are open for Q and A. Uh, please type in your questions into the uh, chat box. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. I I hope you know this morning. Um, you will have gotten something uh, of Zafin. Of course, it is, uh, it is a very brief presentation in the sense uh, it is the, the, this issue of uh, spirituality and secularity um, is only superficially done in this part of the world. So it is crucial for us to look into performance uh, and not separate it from faith. And that is to me very important because <clears throat> we have been uh, performers in this country have been sidelined um, to, to either <clears throat> conformist or non-conformist. And uh, I guess if you look at the indigenous tradition, and uh, not only Zapin, many, many more, uh, understanding the context and the depth of it would perhaps bring about that knowledge, which I guess um, technocrats and politicians and uh, people who, who make policies would understand. Now, uh, I would love to, to have um, questions from you, you all, uh, because I think we have time for that. So I, uh, is there a question here? Um, oh, there's a question here. Yeah, Debbie will help read out the question, Debbie. I will, yes. Thank you, Professor. Um, first question from Lei Meng Lam. Are women allowed to perform zapping in other countries or only in Malaysia? Okay. Um, Zapin of the Hadranis uh, um, are reserved for men. I mean, you don't have women performing. But in the Hadrami community, when they perform Zapin as a secular performance, it is performed within a larger context of events. So um, the idea of uh, men, women participating in Zapin or in, in many other things that associated with Zapin can be done, but they are not performed together. So men and women perform separately. Uh, this is very specific gender grouping. But in Southeast Asia, uh, an insular Southeast Asia, in the Malay archipelago, contemporary Zapin um, performances have really shifted from the traditional in the sense that uh, the new younger choreographers uh, and even composers uh, designed this performance as a mixed gender performance. So if you're looking at contemporary expression of Zapin, uh, there is no clear demarcation between uh, groupings of gender uh, identities, but rather a chorus of performance. But if you're looking at the very specific tradition, like in Johor, uh, they are in Johor, for example, they are just about four or five uh, uh, Zapin from the villages that are performed by men and women. But majority of them are still performed by men. Now, there's a caveat to that. Uh, if they perform, they perform, Zapin is performed normally in the evening after the last evening prayer, Isha prayer. And normally when it's performed for an event, of course, there must be something to celebrate. Now, the people who perform Zapin or practice, they, are, they would come from the surah or the mosque after the last prayer, and they go to the host, where whoever's hosting this event. Now, in the lighted area of the, of the uh, space where you have fluorescent lights and so on, you see men performing. But in the darkened area, in the, in the back of it, within the women, the women perform among themselves. So you have two groups of performances. One, the men perform a bright, in a bright space, a brighter space, the women perform in the darker space. And then, interestingly, within the fringe of this performative area, performance area, you find people from the village who are around sitting and they may join. The men would go into the bright space to join the guys and the girls or the ladies would join the ladies in the secluded, not secluded, but separated area within the performance space. So that is traditional. And when you have contemporary expression, the contemporary work today, uh, most of them no longer keep to this tradition because uh, the aesthetics of stage dance or, cult or, or art dance is different from the aesthetics of the uh, traditional dances of the village. And this you can see all over 
uh, the Malay archipelago from here all the way down to the east. But again, as I said, uh, you can see the specific ones and you can see the general ones. So the choice is there. I, I hope I answer your question. Thank you. Will be the next one. Next one from Adib. Um, thank you for the talk. Do the hand and body movements in Malay Zappin have any sacred significance? I am thinking of the way in which such movements are significant in the Mevlevi Sufi order or classical Indian dance. Good. Uh, I can't connect to the mudras of classical Indian dance because the the Indian classical Indian dance mudras is the extension of the the shastra, the text. Uh, if you look at the Mevlevi, um, there, there aren't really a lot of movements in terms of the arms or the limbs. Uh, there's a twirl. Uh, the, the context of the twirling is very powerful because you only you see a raised one arms raised up and the other arm is um, on the side. And that uh, pivots or connects the, the performer as a performer to the spiritual realm. So that is in the Mevlevi. Of course, we can talk about the same uh, and, and the tarika of um, Lavi and all that. But in the Malay Zappin, the, uh, the arms are very restricted, really. I mean, they, I, they, are, they, are, they are really uh, what I would consider as a mode to action to allow the body to move. There is no specific uh, hands or arm movements that is associated with. But the performance of the Zappin is not divided into sections of the anatomy. It is the whole body, and the whole body moves by the way uh, the steps uh, the steps are made. The designing of the step is the one that is associated with the metaphors. So uh, this is another aspect of Zapin, where every motif that they do represents uh, what we consider is the alam or the environment. It's very, very, very close to the alam or environment. The uh, metaphors or anecdotal metaphors of uh, birds, of, of fish, of fruits and fauna uh, is uh, evident in, in the movement. So the movement with drawing the pattern on the floor uh, represents not only that particular space where the feet design or the foot movement design the design, but is the entire kinesthetic, entire space of the performer that makes the understanding of the metaphors connected with the partners. The partners are very important. It's not a solo performance. So this is when, uh, when, when, the, when the tradition is performed, they would name motifs uh, based on these names that came from the metaphors of uh, their environment. Right, I guess so I can answer the question. Next one. Next one from Azora Abal Abbas. Um, he's wondering, or she's wondering, I hope, um, can we use Zappin as medium of spiritual or religious like the old days, where nowadays Zappin is just a performance or pure dance? Okay, good question. Uh, that was why I was trying to explain uh, today that uh, the intrinsic Zappin is sacred, and this is not expounded on stage. What we see today is um, dancing created, music created to be performed on stage. So the relationship between the beholders, the practitioners, and the community has been separated. Uh, it becomes an art dance. So that's the reason why um, secularity, in terms of secular interpretation, from the mind uh, has been brought onto stage now. The intrinsic idea of zikir, which is another topic that I can go for hours and hours, is performed by the tarika, people of the tarika, the naksabandi, for example. And this is rarely performed, and they perform it as zikir, <clears throat> their remembrance, you know, and uh, it is very important, And but it is in a close quarters. It's not open to public. You have to be invited to perform with them because it's not a performance. It actually is submission. So there's a very different thing between performing for uh, for the beauty of the performance to practicing submission. Now, submiss submission here is submitting by by doing this musicing and working on the zapping. So today, 
they, it, this is the practice, but the public doesn't know this because uh, it is done covertly for many reasons. Uh, it is done so. So I hope Allah uh, gets the picture that uh, the idea of the esoteric uh, is very, very, very little known outside of the beholders, but there are plenty of the of them all over uh, the Malay archipelago. Can I have the next question? Yes, um, this is from Hafsan. Would these extrinsic, secular, and intrinsic spiritual be understood as a continuum in the sense that the secular performance embeds intrinsic intention and vice versa? Okay. Yes and no. Because unless and until the choreographer or the person who arranged it understands the context of the intrinsic, it's not, it's not, going, to be, it's not going to reveal itself, right? Whereas um, the beholders of the sacred tradition, they are not concerned about the extrinsic. They are more concerned of the intrinsic. So uh, there is this, this, this break between practitioners who are performing mind for public gaze that has nothing to do with a, sac a sacred space. It becomes purely uh, disconnected with the intrinsic. But if you look into the idea of performing as, as, it, as submission, then the intrinsic takes over the extrinsic. Whereas if you look at the intrinsic values, the elements of the extrinsic, i.e. in the context of the motifs, the structure, the music, is, is equally powerful, but it's not shared outside and beyond the confines of um, these uh, uh, practitioners of the tarikat. So uh, yes and no, because it depends. The last piece of the zapping that you saw, the last video, with the students of University of Malaya and uh, Sultan Idris Education University. I do not know whether you noticed that the single, the solo performer who came out, and I'm not being brashy, but was me. And I did that to, to in that context to show how intrinsic zapping uh, is performed, but not announce it out, but to show the difference between intrinsic zapping. As you notice, I was doing motifs uh, that was not connected to the uh, the space of the forest, I was doing my modal motif based on the text of the song. So the text of the song is the one that connects me. So my zikr was at the point of beginning to the end. And that was, I didn't want to say it out loud because I don't want people to be confused, but because um, uh, Hazan asked this question, so yeah, you see that you can actually bring the intrinsic up, but it is difficult unless you make sure that the every motifs and every cycle of the song is based upon the verse and understanding the verse rather than using the verse and the music to assist or to accompany the dance. I hope I answer your question, Hamza. Next one, please. Afta um, is asking if there are Indonesian performative Sufism traditions to anything similar to Zapin there, please. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, this is really a, a huge corpus of knowledge which uh, we barely, uh, local researchers really barely touch. Uh, we have numerous um, experts uh, who's from the US and Europe who's looking into these issues. Um, Indonesia has the largest, the biggest uh, collection of living tradition that is very much sacred and looking from Aceh. Uh, which has so many forms of zikir in linear dancing, lean seeking dance, and all that, all the way to Nusa Tenggara. And my last visit to Molucas, to Ambon, uh, was quite shocking because I could see that the uh, element of the sacred uh, performative elements uh, was much stronger in, in Ambon or in Maluku or Halmahera. The reason being is this, Sufism uh, brought Islam, Islam and Sufism came in full force after the 18th century. And after the 18th century, it was the time when Islam moved rapidly to the east, all the way from Sulawesi, all the way towards the, uh, the Moluccas Islands, all the way to Halmahera. So the further east you go, the more you see of the post 18th century Sufi. And if you look at Aceh, which has a very strong connection uh, between that Sufistic tradition, uh, in, in, in between the, the Sunni and Shia group, uh, that comes much earlier. So an answer to your question is yes. 
Indonesia has the largest and most wonderful collection uh, of living tradition that is of uh, this esoteric uh, Sufi performance. Next question. Um, Aisha asks, the songs of Malay Zappin has always been so distinct, especially the sounds of the accordion and violins. And um, she's wondering when these instruments were introduced to the dance, are these sounds, can these sounds be found in other countries as well? Okay, um, good question. The orig original Zappin uh, ensemble, music ensemble, consists of only very basic instruments. There is the Ond, which is the lute or gambus, as a main carrier of melodic and harmonic structure. And you have the drums, the hand drums, uh, the marwas, with a barrel drum. The barrel drum uh, is meant to give the agogic accent to the composition of every beat of the eight beats or eight beats of the uh, of the, the hand drums. Now, other instruments like the accordion or the violin came after this instrument, which is brought and added to Zapin because that was that is the that is the, the kind of works that we are familiar with. So once you're looking at this, if you look at why I said many times that uh, I guess the oldest performative tradition that came from the Silk Road is, is Zappin, for example. And then later on, you have in the uh, 16th century onwards, we have the influence of the Portuguese and so on and so forth. And therefore, the instrumentation from the folk tradition the accordion and the violin and the flute and the guitar are introduced into into Zappin. So this is again a good a good explanation or a good display of how eclectic is um, the ensemble in this part of the world. Uh, the mixture of tradition and as a result of which you don't see this happening in the place of origin. So with the place of origin, the uh, the uh, alloctonous tradition doesn't have this, but the autochthonous inventive tradition has all this. So as you can see this not only here, but everywhere around the world, because uh, when you are not tied to the intrinsic, because in the intrinsic zapin, the only instrument would be the gambus, the hand drums, and the barrel drums. And sometimes you may have the harmonium, but not the accordion. So that's again uh, a big mark between keeping the intrinsic and, and then having the extrinsic uh, dimension of uh, added instrumentation. I, I really hope I answer your question. Uh, it's not easy to answer this, but um, yes, I think that's how it is. Thank you. Right, I'm going to roll two questions into one. And this is from uh, Azora Abal Abbas and Andrew. What is your thoughts, opinion about zapping as dance challenge in video sharing social networking apps such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook? I, I, I don't really care because you see, uh, you can't stop the millennials of inventing new stuff for TikTok. Uh, they are very creative and they, if they wish to have it um, as a battle to challenge, uh, they can do it. But of course they are not doing <laughs> what I consider as being uh, the traditional zapin, because one cannot keep tradition uh, in a cold box or in, in a secure space. Tradition uh, conventionally moves, and uh, one may not know, maybe 20 years from now, the image of zapin may change because of the continuous appearance of the millennials uh, doing TikToking and also doing um, the battles. So personally, from my point of view as an ethno- Ethnologists, um, I, I, I don't mind having to see that, but I mind if that is going to be the norms that would then kill off the tradition. So my, my, oh, my argument is this, I said, well, do whatever you want because nobody can stop you from doing it. There is no right or wrong, but no, do it with the knowledge that there is a tradition behind. It. And the fear is that uh, the millionaires may not know the, the tradition behind it. They don't have the history of it. And that may be the reason why later on they will assume uh, the uh, 21st century version of Zapin is Zapin. Well, I, I guess the one way to, to, to balance this is by producing as many publications and references. And that's what um, I'm doing with my colleagues. You just have to keep on increasing the archival references so that one day if they need to do a referral, there is no problem. Uh, I hope that would work. So uh, yes, I, I, I'm... 
I'm not against it, but I don't encourage it. Uh, but it, it's up to the millennials. I mean, I'm Jurassic. I, I can't relate to the millennials. They, they are doing a lot more great things. Thank you. Okay, um, one more question. Um, Mohammed Kerry Mukhtar asks, what is the effect when the female be part of the main zapping? Um, how does this affect the aesthetics? Can you, can you repeat that again? Sorry, what is the effect when the female is part of the main zapping? And how about the aesthetics? First, as, as I said again, there's nothing wrong having women in Zapin uh, because there are traditions in the Malay archipelago that have uh, women performing. In, in the case of Malaysia, in the case of Johor, women only came in in the 70s. Prior to that, there was no women in Zapin. Zapin has always been associated with uh, a domain of the male performance. The 1770s uh, entrance of women started off with schools where Zapin, particularly in Moor, when Zapin was made to be at the competitive level for schools to compete. And therefore, uh, that was when new invention came in, when women were introduced into, into Zapin, which, which makes what it is now. Uh, and if it is performed today, my, my only issue is, for example, uh, when a, a Zapin that, is, uh, that originates from a male domain tradition, for example, and then perform on stage with women, uh, then you want to see the situation because uh, the choreography is 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 a bit um, um, contrasting. First, if it is a tradition that is performed by men, how would women perform? Because there was no women in that tradition. So the choreographers would put women in, and what they are doing actually is they're doing the movements of the men dressed uh, in, in as women as women performing in the movement. So. It becomes odd against the aesthetics of Zapin because women are uh, Zapin movement, women Zapin's women are more subdued and more refined. So yeah, there is no problem. But if, if the, the quality of, of uh, performance is uh, similar, men and women doing the same thing, you might as well undress them and they look alike. So if you want to have the big, wonderful um, representation, it is very, very important to see how women is represented in Zapin uh, of the male tradition, okay? So I mean, I've yet to see this. I mean, there are good works uh, that has been produced because this have shifted from the uh, traditional practitioners to art dance. You know, remember, we're talking about art dance. So we're talking about composition arrangement that is done for stage and for competition. So here is a situation, therefore, to 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 and to retain Zapin identity is to retain the styles of performances. Uh, women performances in Zapin that are specific for women, like in the Tanjung Labo tradition in Batu Pahat, is a good example where men cannot perform Tanjung Labo because it is that particular Zapin that is meant for women. I have I would be surprised if uh, someone else would introduce men performing in the genre that is purely for women. But what would be inspiring is to look into the statics of the women performing Zapin and, and bring it across into the male domain so that when women perform the specific male dominated Zapin, they will perform as female performers and not representing women in the context of male performance. Uh, I hope I've answered uh, 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 Harold's question on this. Thank you. Right, one more question. Question from Fauzi Rizali. Oh, got a couple more coming in. Um, does the zapping movement have anything to do with the silat and similarity with lower body part? Okay. <clears throat> martial arts, Malay martial arts, um, there are two kinds. Uh, one is um, the soft style, which is the really a stylistic martial art, which is not meant to be combative. The other one is combative martial art. The combative martial art uh, is normally not performed, uh, but it is uh, displayed uh, of strength. Yeah? The stylistic martial art, which is performed in Silat Kulut and all this tradition, uh, are really beautiful. They, they, they are set against the drumming patterns of the shawam or the sarunai. Uh, this is not present in Zapin. 
uh, because first and foremost, it is a Hadrami tradition. So the Hadrami Arabs and Hadramut doesn't do silat. And so never, never was silat in the movement. Of course, this question relates to the fact that contemporary choreographers has gotten to the point where they would put silat movement because when they hear the sound of the drum, it's very inspiring to put silat movements there. Now, uh, just a little correction. In the modern Zapin, the Zapin that came about after the Malay film industry in Singapore in 1950s, all the way to the 1960s, when Zapin from the village was recomposed and rearranged for the film, uh, that became the modern Zapin that we all know. Uh, before the revival of the uh, old Zapin was made in 1990s. And I also grew up with that tradition. I didn't know about the, this tradition that we are talking about. Now, in that particular space, Silat has often been used to, um, to, to employ the notion of the proudness and uh, the greatness of the male, male performers. It is really purely artistic. It is an art dance and meant for film and meant for stage. And there are compositions still, we can see that but not in traditional Zapin, there is no sila. In fact, to be very more, more specific, uh, when the Zapin was brought into the royal palaces, in the Sultan's palaces in Sumatra, in Kalimantan, not in Malaysia, you know, unfortunately, we do not have a Sultan, one, even one Sultan that patronized Zapin, and that can go another chapters of chapters of that. But when they are performed, they are, allowed, they are brought to perform in the palace of Delhi, of Sundang, of Perbangan, of Sia, of, of all this, all the way to Pontiana and, and Bulungan. Um, the performers are made to perform on a carpeted floor, but underneath the carpet is a very uh, interesting, is, a, is, uh, is another mat made of bamboo, which means that it is not easy to perform. Uh, unless you contain your, your contain your movement to be more refined, you're stepping to the small. So you saw the Bengali's version, this after the Lena version, this was brought into the palace of Sia. That's why the movements is so controlled because if they ever move the carpet or the flooring, uh, the cover, they will be banished from the Sultan's uh, view for at least three months. And you can read this in my, in my first uh, book on Zapin by Oxford publication. So that's the refinement that was done. So in this context, therefore, uh, the movement is controlled very much uh, to become what it is, and therefore it doesn't allow uh, the uh, wide um, and very strong ex uh, uh, movements in, in the Zapin. I have been bragging around. I thought I've answered this question uh, to you. Uh, thank you, Azi. Okay, Anissa um, asks, um, does the palace stroke sultanate um, did the Palace Stroke Sultanate have any influence in the evolution of Zapin? Yes. Uh, if you look into um, the uh, <clears throat> traditions of Zapin, especially in the, well, the Indonesian do not have any sultans anymore except for Jogja and Surakarta. And all the Malay sultans in Sumatra have all been banished after the revolution. Uh, but people are still practicing the form. Uh, from, say, um, Serdang Palace and from the Sia and Kampar Palaces. And the, the movement that you saw, the one, the Bengalis, as I say, indicates very clearly that the palace version uh, made the Zapins very, very refined. So when you heard the entrance of the Taksim, uh, the men moved in and they did the salutation. Now, if you look at the salutation, in the Malay salutation, uh, the manner of salutation, one brings your, your set all the way up to, to the right in front here on the above your eyebrow when you are saluting the Sultan. Anything, anyone be below the Sultan, the crown prince or the rest of it goes this level. So this level indicates who is watching. So when you see a Zapin that has this movement, a salutation of this, it shows the most refined Zapin because it was uh, performed for the gaze of the sultan. If you have this, it means it was performed uh, for the aristocrats, and hence uh, most of the practitioners themselves are aristocrats. So yes, the palace had a very strong influence in refining Zapin from the very robust to the most controlled movement. Thank you. 
Um, next question from Rafi. Is there a zapping dance in other names like uh, the Gambus dance in Indonesia? Okay. Um, in Indonesia today, uh, there are <laughs> issues with the name because you have, as I said, it's called Japan, Japan, Dana, and there's also now the word Gambus. Now, yes, in my research in um, uh, in uh, Sulawesi, northeast in Menado, over to the uh, marine uh, park, uh, connecting the Sangalau, the, the, the connecting the islands to Mindanao, uh, are the sea, um, uh, the people, the sea uh, forests, you know, who are actually uh, people who move around and stay in the sea in the boats. And they, they were, they performed zapping. Uh, they are, in this community that I went to I had uh, two, well, very interestingly, the Orang Laut or the people of the sea uh, perform zapping if they are Muslims. But if they are Christian, they don't perform zapping. So you see on the land that they have a church and a mosque and next to one another because their family members or in the same family who may be Christian or maybe Muslim. But those who are Muslim perform zapping and they don't call it zapping and they may call it gambus. Uh, because they refer to the old, the instrument itself. So it is interesting when the name namesake of Zapin may change entirely uh, to refer to the instruments rather than to the notion of it as the Zapin of the Hadrani and Zapin or Japan of the indigenous. And this is uh, very peculiar in Indonesia, yes. And there are many, many more names. Uh, if you go further, further east, all the way to Nusa Tenggara Timur, for example, they don't even call it gambus. Uh, they may have other names that is so local that uh, it is because the, the, the notion of the performance becomes very local and he has no more connection at all with the Hadrami's uh, origin. So yes, uh, to answer your question, it is, it is as such that there are many other names associated with uh, the performance of Zapin in the Malay archipelago. Thank you. Um. Hafsal Aziz asks, what do you think about the creation of Zapin forms in Borneo, specifically in Sabah, Sarawak, Brunei, and Kalimantan? Other than Zapin Tidong um, that you have presented just now, where it has a strong influence of the Hadramis. Thank you. Okay. Um, the Chidung example came from the, the former Sultan of Bulungan, which was burnt to the ground in the 60s. There was this cultural revolution. So the entire aristocrat uh, left Bulungan. This is North East Kalimantan, bordering with Sabah. They left to the island of Simunun in Southern Philippines, the last island of the Sulu archipelago. And from Simunun, they moved over to Tawang, and they brought this to change because the practice of the zikir was strongest in Bulungan. And that's the reason why the Zapin of Bulungan or Zapin Tidong retains a very high percentage of the Hadrami movements rather than the refined movement. Because in the context of the Bulungan palace, it wasn't really the palace that supported it, it's because of the tariqa that supported it. In the, in the Sarawak uh, example, uh, most of Sarawak's tradition came from the former kingdom of Sambas uh, in the southwest corner. And Sambas was a big kingdom that has relation, had a relationship with Brunei. It's a Malay kingdom, as opposed to Pontiana on the west uh, uh, Kalimantan, which was um, a, 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 the, um, a sultanate that was set up by the Hadramis. So the Pontiana Sultanate is all by Sayyids. We have the Said, And they perform very Hadrami style of Zapin in the palace. Whereas the Sambas, uh, the Malay Sambas, they have this very interesting uh, nuance of the refined tradition that is very much associated to the metaphors of the, of the, the sea around them and the rivers around them. And this is then because Sarawak then was not Sarawak in the old days. Sarawak is a new name. Uh, there was no Sarawak. So the Sambas kingdom uh, has greatly influenced most of Sarawak and between Sarawak and Brunei. Then you have Bruneian tradition. The Bruneian tradition also 
had uh, connectivity with the Sambas tradition. And the Bruneian Zapin uh, that one sees today uh, is mostly diasporic. They are not in Brunei. They are actually in Sabah. They are found in Sabah. Uh, so the, the Brunei Malays who migrated to Sabah are the ones keeping the Brunei Zapin. And this is again the lineage of the Sambas Brunei Zapin is all along Sarawak to the west coast of Sabah which is different from the East Coast of Sabah because the East Coast of Sabah had the influence from the Tidong. And the Tidong uh, communities are found not only in Senakan, but all the way to Lahad Datu. So the coastline, the eastern coastline of Sabah is dominated by this particular Zapin that has the strongest Hadrami influence um, as opposed to the Zapins of Sarawak and the West Coast of Sabah. Thank you, uh, Abza. Right, one more question. Adiv asks, is it, is it possible to integrate, integrate Malaysian, Chinese and Indian performance traditions into the Malay Zapin? There is nothing wrong with integration. Uh, when you have composition, when you have new expression, uh, that brings about uh, new choreographies. Uh, if you have it as a cultural expression, yeah, this is extrinsic expression, then there's no stoppage to that. But if you are saying it is an intrinsically related tradition, that's a danger because uh, it's very difficult to do that. So yeah, uh, mind, the word mind playing uh, is the norm of Zapping. So in contemporary Zapping performers, well, I mean, even in Johor, when we did the revival back in the 1990s, uh, the champions for schools are normally from the Chinese school. Uh, it is interesting when the Chinese kids are very good in doing zapping. Of course, it is the extrinsic zapping. It, it is meant for competition. So yes, it is already happening. But uh, I would dare contemporary choreographers to bring the multi-racial representation of zapping. Of course, the question is, what would it signify? Would it signify the zapping of old, or would it signify the zapping of the new? And this is the choice. Uh, because uh, it is up to the millennial to do it. And I don't think there is a problem here to bring all the races together and perform zapping together. And maybe they may perform zapping to new tunes, to popular tunes that is very popular today, which uh, the new tunes came about only in the late 1990s, early 2000, when the old revival zapping came out. Then people like Le Le Panga, the great composer, he created a composed song for City Naliza. And that's when, you know, Zapping became very popular because you have new tunes being rearranged and recomposed. And, and this could be the uh, medium of expression for a multicultural Zapping. And of course, I would love to see that happening. And thank you for that question. Uh, no more questions. Just many thanks on a great presentation. Very enlightening, Professor. Thank you. Um, I think Karen would like to say a few words now. Right. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor. That that was very, very, very interesting and uh, informative um, uh, presentation. Um, when uh, Honey first uh, 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 approached us and uh, um, said that, oh, we have um, uh, a professor who is very, very well versed uh, on the topic of Zapin, we, <laughs> Debbie and I had no ideas, uh, honestly, no idea what uh, Zapin was all about. Yeah, I even thought that it was an, in, an instrument instead of a dance. That, that's how. <laughs> That's how ignorant uh, um, we were, but um, um, you know, uh, uh, we are museum volunteers and we study history and culture and all that. And um, it's surprising that you know that so I've we're so ignorant. We never really knew much at or at all about Zapin. You know, so I'm so thankful that you accepted our invitation and came to you know uh, speak to us about Zapin. And um, and even um, uh, have a uh, created a video um, a presentation so that uh, I can we can uh, uh, view it and watch it over and over again because I think what you have presented today is so much information that I have to see it a few times to really understand what you said and watch your performances um, and not take it for granted for granted that if I see a melee dance or you know thinking just a melee dance and um, not that it can be. Um, that uh, can be another dance, another form of dance. Uh, so I think uh, you have given us a lot to think about. 
Um, and uh, thank you so much for sharing your uh, all the information and knowledge with us today. Um, I also heard that you are also an expert on Wayang Kulit, is that right? No, I'm not an expert on Wayang Kulit. Uh, I, I don't deal with Wayang Kulit. I teach about Wayang, but I'm not an expert in Wayang Kulit. Okay. Yeah, there are other people there, yeah. I see, I see. Because if you are, I was going to ask you whether you could uh, give us a presentation on Wayang Kulit as well. Ah. Okay, yeah, I can suggest to you who could do that job, a uh, good job for that one. Okay. Yeah, can. Um, and, so oh, yeah, uh, well, can I say a few words, Karen? Um, do, do, do you have anything else to add to that I can, I can say and respond to you? Uh, um, no, please go ahead. Okay, first and foremost, I'm very happy, you know, that I, I've given this opportunity because I, I, I know how... Uh, the general public seems to see things as a collage, mm -hmm. you know, which is common anywhere. Uh, and I guess what is crucial here is that, for example, when we did this, uh, when we, you asked us to do the presentation, I decided to do it this way. The reason being is that the Nusantara Performing Arts Research Center, or in short, NUSPA, has been doing a lot of revival exercises, revival work. If you want, you go to the YouTube and you type uh, Nuspak, uh, and you will see now we're doing a huge revival of the Wrong Gang, mm -hmm. which is uh, the most wonderful uh, multicultural expression of uh, what we are as Malaysians. You know, that has nothing to do with religiosity. It came, you know, with the onset of the urban centers in this country. So you can go to Nuspak. YouTube and look at those. We have a lot coming up and we're doing classes and online classes. In the case of this video, that's why we made it such a way to make it a finished product because after uh, we have done this uh, broadcast uh, with you guys, it will be uploaded on YouTube. The reason being is this, I, I wanted to test the water. When I got the poster, when Honey sent me the poster, I flashed it on the Nuspark Facebook. And you know what? We got people responding from all over the world, asking for access. Uh, people from Oxford were asking the same thing, people there. And I said, look, we cannot invite you because this is a closed session. It's not easy to get everybody on Zoom. It is costly, I said. So what I can do is I will make a, a such a way that after the presentation, we'll be, we'll be uploading this on YouTube. And I promise them that. So probably next week, you may see this on YouTube. And in the message box, you see in YouTube, we have a message box at the bottom. We will describe this as a presentation that was made for the museum volunteers. So you'll be credited for the fact that you are the guys who initiated this to be on YouTube. So when there's a citation, they have to cite this as the one that was presented for the museum volunteers. I, I hope the museum volunteers are happy and will allow me to do that. And I will also ask this question. I don't know. Think about it. You don't have to answer to me now. If you guys are interested in learning this kind of stuff, which is mine, really, is place, not for show. It's really to understand it. You know, we have this doing, and uh, we have this in no spot. So think about it. And uh, maybe after PKP, uh, the MCO, we hope, you know, when we have 70% um, uh, inoculation done, you know, then the, we are open space. Uh, we would in, come over to our studio. We have many things here. Take an hour or two and then learn this and practice this and play it around. Yeah, so yeah. that's something. I'm not, I'm, this is not promotion. <laughs> just because I thought I should let you know. Yes, yes. I, I think we, we can put out the, um, the e an email out to our volunteers and then um, you never know. You know uh, I think we will get quite a good response. Uh, this is something that is new to us. I, say, I know it's old, but it's really new to us. And I think that's something which we, I would like to learn. Okay. So, Thank you for the invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for uh, sharing time and space with me. I appreciate it very much. And as I say, this is not the first and last time, I hope. Uh, you know, you can always connect us. Uh, I mean, Honey knows my our emails and all that. Please mm -hmm. feel free to connect with us. And um, I would love to see more activities with museum volunteers because I really, truly appreciate your, your work uh, in bridging the public and... Uh, and what is with the museum. And once again, for all of you, I'm sorry we cannot get physical meeting. It would be fantastic if we are met together today and we can end up with a nice tetare or something after this. Okay. But let, let's put a rain check for this, okay? So, uh, Honey, thank you again for organizing this.
Thank you, everyone. I can see your faces now. And uh, God bless you.